Here's our interview with Sally Pipes. When we talk COVID and, and kind of go back to the beginning, I've always had this theory that we were not prepared for it and we therefore panicked and overreacted. And that when the books are ultimately written about this pandemic, that's going to be uh, the analysis. You know, we're still years away, I think, from really having to have the hindsight to really know what we did right and what we did wrong. But it, it does seem to me this is a 9-11 type situation where we weren't prepared for a terrorist attack like that. And as a result, we panicked and overreacted in many ways. And I, I compare COVID to that in the same way. Do you broadly agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. I and mean, it, it quickly became very political. And of course, you know, Mr. Trump um, was, you know, um, in the hot seat and everything was his fault. And um, yeah, we, we panicked. I mean, we should have been ready. I mean, if you go back to the SARS um, situation from several years ago, um, yeah, I'm Canadian. I grew up uh, in Canada under single payer. I mean, there were so many deaths in Canada from SARS because they ambulances couldn't get into emergency rooms and things. But, you know, we should have been better prepared. But in fact, in the in the long run, I think, you know, Dr. Fauci and Rochelle Walensky from the CDC really scared people. And the mainstream media bought into this panic that Fauci and Walensky and a few others progressives were really, really touting. But mm -hmm. fortunately, as you know, I mean, the 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 Pfizer and Moderna and a few other companies, J and J, I mean, they really went to town and got, you know, a vaccine there and the, the FDA, you know, moved more quickly than they ever have in their existence to get emergency use authorization. And so America is in a very good place, fortunately. So you feel very good about what they've been able to accomplish with the, the vaccines. That, that's something that you look at and think, wow, that, that that's an incredible uh, success. I do. And I said, I predicted about three months ago that we would probably have a glut of vaccines by June and everybody's, oh, no, this is going to be going on. People in the fall, they won't be, still won't be vaccinated. But sure enough, the, the market responded. And I mean, most of the places, you know, I, when I go buy drugstores here in L.A., you know, vaccines available. I mean, everybody I know um, that wanted a vaccine has been vaccinated. And the interesting thing is that you are seeing in the media how people from Canada who have such a catastrophe with the vaccines have been coming down to the U.S. and staying for a month and getting vaccinated here and then going home and having to quarantine for 14 days, even though they're fully vaccinated. So I'm I I think, you know, it really was a spectacular um, effort. And it's unfortunate, though, that, as I say, Mr. Fauci, I call him Dr. Death and uh, Rachel Walensky from the CBC really, really scared people and scared some people into, um, you know, I mean, where, I mean, I see people driving around wearing masks in their own car um, when, you know, they're just breathing their, their own air. So I think, you know, the whole lockdowns, the social distancing, the masks, I think people just got scared. And I think the economy is really suffering from, from the lockdowns. And now people are making so much money by not going to work. You know, we're seeing restaurant tours are having a hard time getting people to come back to work because they're making more money by not working. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the early days, the the lockdown was justified by not overcrowding the hospitals. Right. And right. that seemed to be potentially a legitimate goal. And then that just snowballed. Once you lock down, getting them to unlock down was just impossible. Um, but is that something that we need to be better prepared in the future? So, OK, now we know let's have emergency plans in place so that, you know, immediately hospitals can create extra beds or extra ventilators or extra masks or whatever. Is that the way in which we need to be prepared in the future? Well, I think so. And, you know, we don't one of the reasons we'll talk later about Medicare for all single payer, you know, why we don't want the government to fully take over the health care system and control the, and run run the hospitals because there won't be new hospitals. We need, you know, the, the market in this country has created all kinds of hospitals from, you know, private um, specialty hospitals to big hospitals like under Sutter and UCLA and things. So we need to we need to make sure that the the incentive is there for hospitals to be created for um, medical device companies to be making the kind of equipment that, that is needed. I mean, if you look at, you know, the UK, you look at Canada, I mean, the, 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 um, in the UK, the National Health Service medical director has said they are going to have a tremendous increase in cancer, cancer deaths in the next few years because people couldn't get treated, people couldn't 
at diagnoses and things because the hospitals were absolutely crowded, as you see in the media with India today. I mean, just overcrowded with people, you know, on ventilators and trying to, you know, you know, breathe. So we want to keep this this open so that you know we can continue to be a country where where we have the the very best and we have availability and we we certainly you know I mean they remember they brought the the ship up the the, the uh, ship up to San Francisco and there were there hardly anyone went there there, were, there you know there just weren't enough patients to to need that that ship and it went 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 back to San Diego. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we had one here in L.A. I think it was it was at the Mercy. But um, the Mercy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I say. You know, I, I, again, media overhypes everything. Um, and, and Fauci didn't help. But um, even in New York City, where it was the epicenter for America. Right. Right. That, that ship was barely used. That was sent up to New York City. The Catholic Church was barely used. So, you know, this fear of overwhelming hospitals, I'm not sure there was ever a truly, truly overwhelmed hospital. Oh, I totally agree. And, you know, and if you, you know, if you needed to get your annual mammogram or your five-year colonoscopy, you could get those. I mean, some of the, you know, there were much more careful and social distancing in the, in the waiting rooms and things, but there was availability. And I think that for, for us in America, that's a very, a very good thing. We don't want, you know, so many people delayed their care. And I think a lot of people, even in the U S delayed, you know, going for testing and, and and getting treatments because the media had scared them so much that they were going to get COVID and they would probably die from that rather than, you know, from something, um, a serious illness. I, I think one of the most abhorrent things that that was done that we'll look back on really shamefully is the fact that they allowed people to die alone, that that family members were not allowed to see their loved ones um, you know, during the height of COVID, weren't able to say goodbye, uh, couldn't even have a funeral for the person. I mean, just horrendous. Right. Well, and as we, we are, we've been seeing and we, and we have read, I mean, there's been a tremendous increase in suicides, in drug addiction, in alcohol consumption, because people, you know, people want to be with people and with family and with, with friends. And, you know, for old elderly people who who were in nursing homes or whatever, it was very very sad and very hard on them and, and really made them, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't um, compassionate the way people were treated. And as we know, in New York the city and in big cities, most of the um, deaths from COVID were, you know, 80 some percent were people over the age of 65. And many of these people had co issues, whether they were, it was obesity, other illnesses and things. So really the, the they just went into, into a, the public officials went into a, a lockdown, which was not necessary. And I think very harmful to elderly people who live alone. And, and by the way, this is not all past tense. I can tell you on personal experience from two friends of mine that as you and I are talking right now, uh, it's still the case that only one family member is permitted per day for one hour maximum to visit a loved one in the hospital. And that's two different hospitals that I'm aware of right. that have that policy in place. I presume all of them have that still in place today. Right. And, you know, if you, if you've been fully vaccinated and you've had a test and it's negative, you should be able to, um, you know, go into the hospitals and you should even not even have to wear a mask for that matter. So, but, um, you know, the, it's just been really um, sad how, public officials have made this um, so difficult. Yeah, it's become an obsession and to the exclusion it is an of, obsession. of anything else. Uh, what about some of the conspiracy theories? Do you buy into any of them? I mean, let's start with the vaccine. You have so many people that are concerned that this was all a plan for the drug companies to make money on the vaccine or that this vaccine is going to somehow put something into people that are, they're going to regret down the road. Do you, do you buy into any of the vaccine conspiracies? No, I don't. I mean, I think I think one of the things that, you know, people are saying, well, it was it was approved so quickly. Well, the, the real problem is that other, you know, other drugs and biologics and cancer drugs should not be under the delay that they have been for years under the FDA. It shows that the FDA could move quickly and they, they did the clinical trials and they work well. So I think it's, um, you know, a lot of people on the progressive left, of course, hate the drug companies, but they moved very quickly. And I think I don't believe in any of this conspiracy theories. And I think a lot of people that are saying, I'm not going to get vaccinated because it was approved too quickly 
or we're going to get some rare um, other illness. Well, I think people should think, would you rather, you know, at the vaccine and be, you know, vaccinated against it? Or would you rather get COVID and perhaps end up on a ventilator in a, in a hospital? I mean, you, people have to look at it that way and say, what is the alternative to not getting vaccinated? So, and I think, um, you know, the vaccination rate is much higher than it was being predicted, you know, back, you know, sort of in late December after the emergency use authorization. But I think people need to look, would you rather, you know, get vaccinated? And, you know, for the most part, you, I had two two vaccinations. I was totally fine after both the Moderna vaccine. So I think, you know, there's a lot of hype by conspirators who are trying to scare people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, it's not nothing. There there have been some elderly that have been reported to have died from the vaccine. Right. Uh, you know, my, my mother got very sick off of the second shot, but, you know, she recovered and so on. So, um, you know, I, I think the hesitancy is is understandable, but but you're not seeing any conspiracy there. And what what about Bill Gates? I, I was reading some of the things you've written recently and you seem to be applauding Gates on some of the things that he's done. What, what do you think about Bill Gates and his role in all of this and the things that he's done on vaccines, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates and their foundation, you know, they have a lot of money in that foundation. And some of the things, you know, that they have been doing, you know, whether it's, you know, supporting, he's been very supportive of, of the vaccine. He's been very supportive of, you know, poor countries in Africa getting vaccinated, getting, you know, getting American doctors to go over and train doctors over there. And whether it's, you know, um, diseases like Ebola or or whether it's, you know, del maternity deliveries. I, I think that he, you know, his heart is in the right place. He's probably not a free marketeer totally, but, but I think that, you know, on this issue of, of COVID, he, he understands and is being very um, supportive and has got the funding to um, definitely, you know, help get many more people vaccinated and even, you know, in, in countries that don't have access to, to the vaccine that, that need it, whether it's India or whether it's South Africa or, or whatever. And we don't want, you know, to take away the intellectual property protection that the WTO is trying to do uh, with, the, with the drug companies that produce these uh, vaccines. Yeah, let, let, let's talk a little bit about that in, in the vaccines in, in other countries. So, I haven't read a lot about this, but I've been kind of hearing that Europe has been slow to get the vaccine because the drug companies weren't willing to sell it to them at the price that they were dictating. Is that true? Well, I mean, I think let's look at, at Europe and the EU. You know, Britain, Brexit, Britain got out of the EU and look at how many people, you know, they've had a tremendous uh, vaccination rate. And, and uh, today, uh, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is opening up uh, Great Britain, uh, they they left the EU and they got the AstraZeneca vaccine and they got people vaccinated. The EU, um, of course, you know, was very, um, very progressive. They didn't want to pay the price, the, re the reduced price, so they kept delaying. And I think it was very harmful to the people of Europe. And you look at countries like Italy, France, Germany, Portugal, Spain, they still have very high rates of COVID, a lot of deaths from COVID because they were the, the, the powers that be in the European community, European Union, were just, you know, being stubborn. And I think it was a, a, at, the, at the expense of their, their citizens' health. And what's the state of that uh, as we speak? Have they negotiated a price now? And are, and are the vaccines flowing into the rest of Europe? So it's, it, and of course, this is very, very political, as you, as you know. Um, they are now starting to get you know, the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine available. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit late. I mean, as I say, they, you know, we as Americans can't travel to these countries. And even if I, as I'm fully vaccinated, if I wanted to take our annual vacation and go to Italy, I wouldn't because what if I get there and then there's a further surge and I couldn't get back. I mean, so I think they're, they're, they're slow. They're starting to, you know, realize this, but the whole thing I think was very political. They wanted to you know, be separate from Britain because they were annoyed that Britain left the European Union, but Britain got its people vaccinated and has had very good results compared to, as I say, these countries, Italy, France, Germany, Spain, and Portugal, just as examples. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope the British put two and two together and realize that uh, this was a good thing that they left the EU if for no other reason but this. I, I was talking to a Brit recently who kind of, I, I could tell that he was anti-Brexit, but but he had to begrudgingly acknowledge that 
this turned out to be a, a good thing. I mean, why you would want to be under yet another layer of government uh, if you're a, a Brit, I don't understand, but um, I know obviously it was highly controversial. Well, and even even if you look at the local elections from a week ago, I mean, a lot of these Labour seats all went conservative because I think people even who had always voted Labour realized that they were in a good place. They voted uh, for the Conservatives rather than the Labour Party, which would have probably left England in the same situation as these European countries. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it could start something, and, and Britain won't be the only one that uh, that exits. Uh, so, so talking about those, the, the 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 price of the vaccines segs into a discussion about drug prices and so on. So, it's my perception that you know everybody complains about, oh my gosh, drugs are so expensive in America, and they're less expensive in other places, and that's because in these other countries they have negotiated a set price. They refuse to pay anything more than for than a particular amount for their drug. We're paying more, I guess you could call free market prices. And in that sense, we're kind of subsidizing the rest of the world through our higher prices and they're paying lower prices. Is that roughly correct? Well, right. The United States does not have price controls on its pharmaceuticals. And these countries, whether it's Canada or England, France, are all free riding off our research and development. I think people don't realize it costs about 2.6 billion from an idea to get a drug through all the clinical trials, the FDA, and get it to market. So it's very expensive. Only about 12% of drugs ever make it through through this uh, through this process. So countries, as I say, they, they're free riding. Uh, United States drug companies sell drugs to these countries at a, at a lower price. Um, it's interesting in Canada, where I'm from, the uh, Patented Medicines Prices Review Board has to look at, of the federal government, has to look at the price of a drug and decide whether or not it's the right price to offer it um, on the formularies in each of the provinces. In many cases, the latest drugs aren't even available because this government body says it's, it's too expensive. But I think, you know, the under the Biden administration, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, they're all trying to bring about uh, price controls on pharmaceuticals and biologics in this country. I know under HR3, the House bill, uh, where they're trying to tie the prices of drugs to um, the prices in six most favored nation countries, Canada, England, France, Australia, Japan. Um, and I think I just read the other day that uh, Pelosi is having a hard time. I mean, this has been a, a, a central core of Biden's agenda was price controls and getting lower drug prices. But some of the Dems are saying now, well, I don't know if this is such a good idea. We are the country where the innovation takes place. And that you look at the polling, the drug companies are polling very, very well because people realize we are the, the country that developed the vaccine. So I think um, we don't want Sorry, but what you're saying is what we're seeing happening in Europe with them trying to negotiate down the price of this vaccine and therefore not getting it that quickly. This is an example of what happens all the time in these countries, that they don't get the drugs as quickly because they're trying to negotiate down the price, whereas the U.S. is getting them as soon as they're released. And they may not even be available. As I say, a lot of the drugs in Canada, the latest drugs, the, the government decides it's still too expensive. And then you've got states like Florida. A Republican governor in Colorado, a Democratic governor who, you know, have signed legislation that would allow importation of cheaper drugs from Canada. The Canadian officials, there's only 37 million people in the whole country, fewer than in the state of California. They're saying, we don't have enough drugs for our own people. We <laughs> cannot be the drugstore for, you know, <laughs> you know, all these people in in these other states. So, you well, know, that's, I mean, just, that's just stupid policy, it seems to me, because is, if yeah. you're going to say we're going to import drugs from Canada, well, the only reason they're lower there is they price fix there. So right. you might as well just say we're going to price fix here if that's what you want to do. Right. And then the whole research and development and innovation sector, which, you know, will be will be beaten way down. I mean, there's a reason why um, companies like GlaxoSmithKline, which is a British company, AstraZeneca, um, a British company, uh, all of these um, com um, companies, they don't do their R&D in their home country. They do it in the U.S. because the market works and they know there will be a lot of losses. But at least the, the incentive is there to to do the research and development and not in, in their home countries. So explain to people why I believe you think it's a bad thing for Medicare 
and Medicaid to be able to negotiate drug prices? Because it certainly sounds like a reasonable thing. Oh, yeah, of course, we should be able to negotiate drug prices. Why is that a bad thing? Well, because this is what um, Pelosi and Biden and Bernie Sanders are all pushing for, the government to negotiate prices between the government and the drug companies. And what it's going to mean is if this happens, it's going to reduce the availability of the, the newest and latest drugs uh, for for seniors who, you know, people, you know, who are 65 and over or people who are um, lower income and who are on Medicaid, the program for low income Americans. These are the people that use drugs and need drugs. And if if they have price controls on drugs, it, as I say, between the federal government and the and the drug companies, these drugs will not be available. And they also, it will destroy the incentive for research and development. And I think, and as I say, a number of the Democrats are now realizing this is not going to be a good idea. And I think it's going to be hard for Pelosi to get that House bill uh, through, through the House. And it definitely probably would not get through the Senate because the Senate at 50-50. Um, and then you've got someone like Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema from Arizona, who probably wouldn't support it. But it'd be harmful to the very people that need uh, drugs in order to allow them to stay out of hospital and live longer and healthier lives. So, so help people understand, though, if the, the government can't negotiate the price, then who is setting the price? Are you, is the drug companies unilaterally simply setting a price and the government has to pay it? Well, the government, yeah, the, the drug companies negotiate with insurers and 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 with 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 the government but um and then you know a drug is under um intellectual property protection patent protection for x years i think 12 years and then it comes off 95 percent of the drugs consumed in this country are generic drugs which as you know are copies of the original drug and they can be exact copies and they're they're a lot they're a lot cheaper yeah, and they're but and, let, let, let's stick with something that's an it's a new drug it's patented and now Medicare is going to, I don't know, you tell me how this works. Medicare is going to decide whether it's going to make this available to Medicare patients. And if so, they're going to decide what the price is. How, how does that all work? Well, so, of course, there will be a whole new layer of bureaucracy in order no, I'm to talking have about right now. R right now, how does right it work? Now. Oh, right now. So um, there are things called um, pharmaceutical benefit managers, PBMs. And the pharmaceutical benefit managers negotiate uh, with the with the government and the, the um, insurers to decide what what the price will be. So this is a problem because a lot of the lower prices that that are negotiated um, don't the, the 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 cheaper price does not go back to the patient. It goes back uh, to the um, to the um, to the insurer. And so we really need to get rid of pharmaceutical benefit managers and get the negotiation to go between uh, the insurer and the, and the drug companies. We don't need these, these middlemen are taking the profit and not helping the consumer to get the, uh, the reduced price of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a drug. And particularly a lot of these new, new drugs are orphan drugs, they're very, very expensive. But on the other hand, I mean, if you, if you um, say, if you take a drug uh, for hepatitis C um, from um, Gilead, you know, the cost is perhaps $80,000 a year, but you could get rid of, you completely eliminate hepatitis C. If you need a new liver, the cost is $500,000 and it's very hard to get a liver. So, you know, you have to look at balance. So, you know, what, what about, you know, what are the new drugs and what is the cost of um, not being able to, of, of having to go and have an expensive surgery and maybe not be able to get, mm. you know, a new liver. So, so bottom line, the, the, the price that's ultimately set on any new drug is set by the drug company after negotiating with the insurance companies, pretty much? Well, the, the, the drug company sets the price that they're going to sell that drug at, and the PBM negotiates, you know, on behalf of large groups. So, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the insurance companies are going to decide whether or not we're going to cover it or not. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And same so, with Medicare. Medicare decides Medicare. Whether, whether or not they're going to cover it or not. Right, exactly. And so, right. um, and as I say, the, it's the people on Medicare and Medicaid that are the big users of drugs. But, you know, so in so many cases, we need, we need to promote generic drugs because they are very cheap once the drug comes off patent. But for the new drugs, yes. And the, the drug companies have a lot of programs out there that, 
you know, provide, will provide the drug, you know, at a, at a, at a greatly reduced cost or even for free, um, you just have to be able to, you know, figure out what the, the plans are. But a lot of these drug companies have programs that make it possible for people who don't have, you know, the income of a Bill Gates or Warren Buffett to get access to these new treatments. So let, let's now talk about healthcare in America and go high level. I mean, it's a it's a freaking mess. I mean, it, it's just such an amalgam of so many things between the insurance companies and and the government and and state controls and federal controls and so on. Um, it's not a free market in nope. America. Most people recognize that it's our free market principles that made America's economy so great. Yet those free market principles have been stripped out of healthcare. It seems to me and helped kind of create this mess. So why don't you just kind of comment on that and, and see how we can get to a high level solution to this. Right, so um, competition and choice in all aspects of American life are the way the way to go and get, you know, the best coverage or whatever. Unfortunately, 50% of healthcare in this country is already in the hands of government, whether it's through Medicare for our seniors, the Medicaid program for low income Americans, the CHIP program for children, and of course the Veterans Administration, which is a single payer healthcare system, which is not, I wish people would you know, pay attention to the stories about how our vets you know, cannot get access to the, the best doctors and hospitals and things because the government doesn't make it you know, easy for them. There's been a lot of, of best long waiting times and everything. So we want to open up the system um, to more competition. Unfortunately, under the Biden administration, under Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, all of these people are supporters of a complete government takeover of the healthcare system. And people don't realize what it means. For example, in Canada, there's no private healthcare for anything considered medically necessary. The average wait from seeing a primary care doctor to treatment by a specialist last year, 22.6 weeks. That's over five months. The American people wouldn't stand for this. And the fact that, you know, Biden, when he was campaigning against Bernie Sanders, said, well, I don't support Medicare for all. I support building on Obamacare, a public option, a government insurance plan to compete against private insurers. That's just a stepping stone approach to single payer. And um, it'd just be a more a slower approach than Sanders wants or the uh, the House side, Pramila Jayapal, uh, Debbie Dingell and um, AOC. So we need we need to put doctors and patients in charge instead instead of, of the government. We need to support ideas, you know, like health, promoting health savings accounts, health reimbursement accounts, which uh, Donald Trump allowed to happen. The, the short term limited duration plans that Biden and his team want to get rid of those plans, short term limited duration plans, which were reduced under Obamacare to um, to just six months. They're now available for 12 months, renewable for three years. So young people, no, not for everybody, but young people like us, we might want to buy a plan that doesn't have to have 10 essential health benefits and mandates and regulations and spend, you know, less than a hundred dollars a month on a plan. We're probably not, you know, going to get sick or need, need that or association health plans. All of these things are things that will open up the market and, you know, a member under Obamacare, which turned 11 on March 23rd, there are 10 essential health benefits that have to be included in an insurance plan. And so they add, you know, 20 to 50 percent to the cost of premium. So the more you let government in, the more it's going to destroy um, what we have now. But we need to, you know, as I say, open up telehealth. You know, it took the pandemic, you know, <laughs> to be to be there in order to open up telehealth, which I've been promoting for years. So doctors and patients can talk, you know, online for people who are in rural communities who don't have access perhaps to doctors or transportation. Telehealth is now going to be part of, of our regular healthcare system. We need, you know, and also nurse practitioners and, um, um, and patient um, uh, physician assistants they've been able to do a lot more under the pandemic and they should have been able to do more. Yeah, we let's, need to let's have... talk about something something like telehealth, which um, is taking advantage of modern technology uh, to create more right. efficiency, right? And right. Why, why was that not used before? Is it because the insurance companies were not, wouldn't cover a telehealth visit? Is that why they weren't using telehealth before? Right, exactly. So they weren't. And also, I think a lot of docs, older docs, you know, were kind of worried about it and thought it was, you know, 
they would probably earn less money if the patient wasn't coming into the into their office. But as you know, you know if you're if you go into a doctor's office, particularly with COVID, um, you, you were worried about being in the waiting room and picking up you know, COVID or some other right. illness. So I think but, but there so was a very, lot of... So it's very important though, if what I, I'm identifying here, or you're identifying, which is that insurance companies are keeping these type of innovative ideas, government also, but insurance companies too, right. these innovative right. ideas from coming forward because they've got all these policies and procedures and they're right. very slow to change these policies and procedures. So what you're saying is under during COVID, insurance companies changed and said that, yes, right doctor, we will pay you for a telehealth visit that we didn't used to pay you for. Right, exactly. And particularly it's particularly under under Medicare, they allowed telehealth things that for older people that don't have cars can't, you know, get out to get to um, a doctor or have access in a rural community to the very top, you know, surgeons or cancer specialists, which, you know, telehealth allows that to happen. I mean, the, the tech sector has really done a terrific job in making this available. And it, it was just a stumbling block until we had a pandemic. And so, right. so I'm, I'm really one hoping of my, that it's it, going to become permanent. It fits um, into one so of, there's some pushback. It, it fits into my theory that, you know, our problem here is not just the government's intervention. It's this reliance on the insurance companies that they sit between the patient and the doctor. When I go to see the doctor, it's not like walking into McDonald's. I don't see a board up there that tells me what a physical is going to cost me, what a blood test is going to cost me. I don't care what it's going to cost me. I I don't ask. I don't care because the insurance company is going to pay it. Um, And so when you've got someone in between the patient and the middle doctor, and the, a middleman, fraud is opened up. Pricing is 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 out the window because nobody cares about pricing. So this that's why Obamacare is so terrible, in my opinion, that mandates that everyone who lives and breathes in America must buy insurance, where insurance, I think, is half of the problem. Right. No, you're, ab- you're absolutely right. And, you know, one of the um, executive orders that Mr. Trump signed was the um, bill on hospital price transparency. Because as Milton Friedman used to say, if you have no idea what something costs, you're going to demand a lot more of it. And just like if you work for Hershey, the Hershey company in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and you didn't have to pay for your groceries, you're going to fill your cart, you know, with steak and things, not hamburger. And so, you know, the, this whole thing, this middleman thing is pushed up the cost of healthcare and people will use a lot more if they think it's, it's free. And so we need to, um, price transparency is very important. And in some of the hospitals, you know, are not, are supposedly I've been reading are not even, um, you know, um, following the law on, on, on posting prices. I mean, naturally, but, you know, and, you, and even if they did, it, it would be a very beneficial step if they did because they don't yes. at all. But even if they did, I still don't really care because my insurance company is paying for it. So, right. Yes. What, what, yeah, right? It's, so, so it's what, for, I, what I, it's what we it, call first dollar coverage. You know, you, you don't care as if your employer is paying for your insurance. You just don't care as long as you get what you want when you want it. Right. So, so shouldn't insurance insurance was designed to protect people against catastrophic loss. Your house right. burns down. Right. Right. So shouldn't health insurance be only catastrophic loss? You get cancer, you right. get a major car accident, although that's auto insurance covering that typically. But your routine medical, your physical, your blood test, your basic stuff, insurance companies shouldn't be the ones covering that. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, insurance should be there, you know, for catastrophes, just like I don't, you know, use my car insurance to replace the oil or the tires on my car. And so we shouldn't, you know, these like regular checkups and things, um, things that people should be paying for those themselves and the insurance should be there for um, right. for catastrophes. There's some exciting things going on with direct primary care where people can negotiate, you know, a price and X number of uh, um, appointments with a primary care doctor. And um, and it's very it's very useful, but it's hard to get people's mentality changed. I mean, well, and by the way, Sally, but, but they're also but, but they're also theoretically violating the law if they do that, because right now, Obamacare mandates that you have insurance. So I can't yes. go try to negotiate something. I mean, my brother could be a doctor. Right. And have his own doctor's office and say, Jim, brother, anything you need. 
come to my office, it's on me, right? But right. nonetheless, I'm still mandated by the federal government to buy health insurance, even though my brother's taking care of me for everything. Right. So people under Obamacare, as you as you pointed out, which I just said was 11 years old. I mean, we only had like eight million people signed up for Obamacare on the exchanges because the premiums were so high because of all the mandates that they, the insurance company had to provide. A lot of insurance companies didn't even offer an exchange plan in in several states. And the deductibles are so high that, you know, if, if, you, if you're paying as an individual four hundred dollars a month for um, an exchange plan and you're um, deductible is five to six thousand dollars. I mean, if you're not, most people don't have that kind of money sitting around. So people didn't even sign on to um, to the exchanges. And Biden said, well, the way to get more people is to open up the enrollment period and this special enrollment period that he signed from February 15th to August 15th. But the real issue is people are not buying that coverage because it's too expensive. So then what does the government do? Provide more subsidies and saying people cannot spend more than 8.5 percent of their income. Um, on their premium. And now that was under the American Rescue Plan. Now it looks like under the American Families Plan, of course, that's going to become permanent. So it's another stepping stone into government determining right. what kind of health care we get and how we get it. And this, I, this type of insurance that you and I agree would be the proper type of insurance, the catastrophic only, it right. essentially doesn't exist because the government, both state and federal, mandates that if you're going to sell health insurance, it better cover this and 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 this. And the list keeps getting longer and longer as all the things it better cover to the point where you can't get catastrophic health insurance. Am I correct? Well, I mean, exactly. The issue is, I mean, there should be like in all aspects of our life, whether it's banking or our phone service or the type computer we buy, there's competition, but it's so difficult. And how can there be new entrants into the healthcare uh, field when when it's too expensive to, to enter the field? So it's really a small number of whether it's Anthem or Blue Shield or um, Cigna or, you know, just a few companies can, you know, they're huge. They can, they can manage this, but it, our, the system destroys the incentive for new entrants uh, into the field. Now, under health savings accounts, you can put X dollars away per year in your in your bank account, carry it forward, and you can um, then you have to tie that to a catastrophic plan. And there are about 22 million Americans who have health savings accounts. But you know, people are, are scared of change. People are so entrenched in the idea that you have to have you know your 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 blue your Anthem Blue Cross coverage, and it comes from your employer. And you think, well, it's free. Of course, you're earning less money because it, you're, if your company is paying for for your coverage. Yeah. Well, and the insurance companies have to make a profit, so they're making lots of money, and in, in, in that, that's just sucking money. That, that's totally inefficient dollars, right? If you're talking about taking care of people's health, right. insurance companies making money that doesn't help anyone. So why Obama and Biden thought that it was a great thing to hand over health care to insurance companies and make them even more powerful and to mandate simply by breathing air in the United States of America, you are a criminal if you don't buy health insurance. It's unbelievable the Supreme Court didn't strike that down. This is a different story, but that that's the solution uh, is just seems so crazy to me. Well, well, exactly. And, and um, you know, I mean, Obama ran on, he was going to bring in Obamacare and he was going to cut the rate of the un insured and he was going to reduce the cost of health coverage and the cost of health coverage you know has not you know not gone down and we don't have 100 percent of people covered a lot of people just decided you know not to you know not to not to um to have have coverage and and to pay you know the the, the fines yeah. so but we the only need, thing and that, the other, the only, sally aren't you agree the only thing that brings down prices is competition and innovation Right, exactly. And they're destroying and, those two things. And also, you know, you want you want the doc, you want to have a, a a relationship between you want to empower consumers, a relationship between the doctor and the patient. Not, you know, as you know, when you go to the doctor's office, you have set up your appointment. The first thing they ask you, if they don't ask you on the phone, what is what insurance do you have, and and can we take a photocopy of of your card? I mean, so that's you know that's. So here's a question for you. Why is the left so obsessed with healthcare and having the government controlling it? Um, I think it's because people like Bernie Sanders 
and uh, AOC and um, Kamala Harris. They want the government to be in charge of our lives. They do not want the American people to be in charge of making decisions about their health care, about their children's education. And so this is a further way to um, get control over, over our lives. And as uh, even Bernie Sanders said, it would cost 30 to 40 trillion over 10 years to um, get to, for the cost of, of, of uh, single payer health care. Doctors would be paid 40% what they're paid today because you have to cover the costs, there would be ration care, doctor shortages, new taxes. And when you poll people about Medicare for all, 45, uh, 55% say they support it. But when you say you're going to lose your employer-sponsored coverage, support goes down to 38%. And when you're told you'd have to pay higher taxes, 26%. But these people want the government to be in charge of, of, of your life. And I think it, it, that's not the American way. I came to this country because I didn't, I wanted to get away from it. The government controlling many aspects of my life, including uh, my health care. Yeah. My theory as to why they want that, because it is kind of hard to really, when you really think about it, why are they so obsessed by this? But I, I think it's just this anti capitalism uh, fervor right. that runs through that. And for them, the idea that someone could profit off of someone's bad health is so abhorrent to them that that's why they need the government to take it over because you've got all these bad people out there making a profit off of people's bad health, which is true, but also just happens to be the best way to find healthcare solutions is to allow entities to profit, i.e. the drug companies, et cetera, et cetera. But I, that's my personal theory as to why they're obsessed with this. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you're basically saying the same thing as I, I'm saying. I mean, it's it's the, the capitalism, you know, is, is bad. And we've seen a lot of corporations buying into the same progressive ideas that, that Sanders et al. Are, are promoting. And, you know, um, so it will be very, very expensive. And, and, and what Bernie Sanders doesn't say is, of course, we'll have waiting lists, we'll have ration care, older people won't have access to the best treatments. And, you know, um, cancer deaths will be up. We, you know, it's going to be, and people, you know, he says, well, you don't, you know, people, we call our dermatologist and make a direct appointment. You know, in Canada, you have to go through a primary care doctor before you can see a specialist. And so the average wait, as I say, is over five months from seeing primary care doc to treatment by a specialist. But Canadians have an escape valve. Over, over 300,000 Canadians come every year to the U.S. and pay out of pocket for the fact if they want to get an MRI and they think they have a brain tumor, they don't want to be on the the waiting list, you know, for three months when you think you have something seriously wrong. This is why Michael Buble, the, the crooner, when his three-year-old son was diagnosed with liver cancer, he didn't stick around in Vancouver. He went to Los Angeles to the Children's Hospital of LA and had the very finest treatment with the finest doctors. Yes, he could afford it, but the option was there. And a lot of even middle-class Canadians come here to, to pay out of pocket for something they think is important and it's about their health. Uh, the single payer will be the same here as it is in England, as it is in Canada and other countries. Care will be rationed. So, so let's touch on that a little bit as far as what the truth is about socialized medicine in these other countries. Um, is it is it your position that America, even though our healthcare system is being slowly destroyed, it still is better than most? And w would you say that the highest quality of medical care uh, um, is provided in the United States of America compared to any other country? Yes. And I think people, people with, you know, with, with funds come here um, and get, you know, and pay for their care uh, for, and for new treatments and things if, if, if they're going to be on a waiting list. I mean, the, the um, head of the British Medical Association has said because of COVID, there are 4.5 million Brits on waiting lists trying to get to get appointments and get surgeries and, and things, they haven't been able to do it. And it's going to have a negative impact on, on life expectancy. Um, so, you know, you look um, at uh, cancer survival rates five years out, the United States has the highest five-year cancer survival rates for most common cancers, colon cancer, lung cancer, um, 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 uh, testicular cancer, all of these kinds of things. So, you know, and we, the very best and brightest in this country go into medicine. If the government takes it over completely and the fact that government will determine doctors are paid 40% less, 
the best and brightest kids are not going to go into medicine and we're going to dumb down the whole thing. And it's not free. The average Canadian family pays $14,474 a year in hidden taxes for a system where they, the care is rationed, they have to wait, and um, they, they, can't, they can't find doctors because there's a doctor shortage because the government can't afford to, to train these, these docs at the government-run universities. So we, we've got the highest quality of medical care in the world because of the free market principles that we have that they do not have in other countries right. when it comes to medicine. The very free market principles that Biden, Obama, Sanders, AOC want to get rid of. Exactly. They, they as, as I said earlier, they want to be in charge of how you get your health care, what kind of health care you get. And, and the government is going to to pay for it. And it's going to be um, a, a disaster for, for us. And I say, well, where where are we going to go if the government fully takes over our health care system? My idea was to um, get some liberty ships and have them offshore so that because when government is in control, they will not allow a private private coverage to run because they don't want a bit in Britain, the National Health Service, which came into being in 48, um, they allowed private health care to run parallel and about 20 percent of Brits now have private coverage. And the Canadians, when they went to Britain and said, what mistake did you make? You don't want people to be able to compare. And so Bernie Sanders wouldn't want um, people to be able to compare the, their private coverage with the government coverage. So that would be totally outlawed. And his plan would come in over four years. Let, let, let me ask you about that. You know, in these countries, let's stick primarily with with European countries and Canada that that have socialized medicine, you know, single payer. Do most of them allow people to, you know, wealthy people to nonetheless get private coverage or do they not allow it? Yeah. So there are only three countries in the world that have two single payer health care, Canada, North Korea and Cuba. Um, three uh, three countries that you probably don't want to go to for your health care. These other countries have what we call universal coverage plans. So a lot of them, as I say, the UK allows private coverage, France, Germany, people. There's a government government plan, but people with money pay extra because the waiting list on the on the government um, plans is so long now and government has to keep cutting back because the cost of it is going up and they don't have the taxpayer revenue to cover it. So they have it's they have more of a choice than what so, we have. So, so the wealthy. So, so what you're saying is unless we go with the Canada, North Korea, Cuba plan, right, right. where we outlaw essentially outlaw any other form of medicine, which I just can't imagine how you could constitutionally do that in America. But unless you go that plan, which, you know, very few, I think, would support that. What you're really doing is implementing a very low level of coverage for 90 percent of the people. And then the wealthy will have fantastic coverage because they'll pay for it. So as, as far as you know, what these guys want, you know, helping out the, 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 the poor, the middle class, the truth is it's just going to inure to the benefit of the wealthy. They'll be the ones that are able to benefit from great care and everybody else won't. Right. But in America, if Bernie Sanders or Pramila Jayapal, Debbie Dingle get their Medicare for all plan through, they will not allow any private coverage for anything considered medically necessary. The well, only I, I thing just can't just I hate to interrupt, but I mean, I just can't I, I get it that that's what they want. But practically speaking, I just can't imagine in America it ever passing that right no I, I i agree but it's but you know the the physicians for national health insurance all these people are really pushing pushing hard so yeah you're right it'd be there'd be two two classes and we have as i say 50 percent of our health care is in the hands of government now i mean look under medicare um what the percentage of people on medicare who have to buy supplemental um coverage um you know or medicare advantage plan because they want to keep their doctors. So many docs won't keep um, Medicare patients that don't have supplemental or Medicare Advantage plans because the reimbursement rates are so low. A lot of the people on Medicaid, the program for low-income Americans, a lot of them have a hard time finding a doctor also because the reimbursement rates are too low. And so, you know, this these are things that gov when government sets the pricing, um, it's, it's, it's not good for our health. Mm -hmm. Let, let's kind of wrap up by talking about, and I think that you, you, you've got a book out now that's called False Premise, False Promise, right? The Disastrous Reality of Medicare for All. Yes. Yeah. And, I, you know, I haven't read the books. So I don't know what the false 
premise is, but it, but it, I'm going to guess the false premise, and I'd like to talk about this, or then you can add on to it, is the idea that healthcare is a right, and that's you hear that mantra all the time. And number one, it it isn't a right; it's nowhere in the Constitution. The Constitution is is where we get our our right from, and, and it's not in there. And what I always like to say is, well, if you're going to say healthcare is a right, because my gosh of course we should take care of people's health. What's more important to your health than what you eat? Without food and water, you perish. So if healthcare is a right, food should absolutely be a right. So how come they are not talking about a government takeover of food production and and pro- basically providing food for every single America? Have the government in charge of food. Why not? Well, and also a right, you know, a right, Right to housing. I mean, these are the things. I mean, if they're, you know, Bernie Sanders and AOC, all they talk about is health care is a right. And they're, they'll be talking next about the right to food, a right to housing. But a right to food is more important than, than a right uh, to health care. Health care is a good and service like any other good and service. And it's necessarily scarce. So if you declare a right to health care, that is green lighting essentially unlimited demand for health care. But it won't miraculously engender a complete, uh, an unlimited supply of health care. Um, does would it mean that the government, if the if health care becomes a right, does it mean the government will say everyone has the right to top notch care or just simply a right to equal care, which is the case in in Canada? Chief, Madam Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin said having a care card does not give you access to a doctor and to care. Um, does the government have the right to tell you? Uh, that you can't get access to a treatment if you're or obese or you're a smoker. That's the way it is in the National Health Service. A lot of procedures aren't available because the government determines that you're too fat or you're smoking, and so you can't have these certain procedures. So, um, and the government would um, have the ability, if healthcare is a right, to ban us from paying privately for healthcare. I mean, to get better care. I mean, healthcare is not a right. It's a good and a service, or uh, it's a good and service, and it's unlimited, and it's like any other thing that we need to um, keep the market open so that people can access a lot of the best care by having options, whether it's you know health savings accounts, health reimbursement accounts, um, short-term limited duration plans, association plans. We need more choice, not less. As, as PJ Wart says, if you think healthcare is expensive now, just wait until it's free and it's a right. Yeah. Look, I, I think the reason I think the comparison to food is a perfectly good comparison that if if healthcare should be a right, food should be a right. right. And and but the reason they don't push for that is they know how absurd that sounds to have the government take over all food production. I mean, that would right. include restaurants and so on. Everything would be government run. And because, but because people go to the grocery store all the time and they go to restaurants all the time. And they would think about, hmm, what if it was the, a government-run grocery store and a government-run restaurant? No way would I want that. But when it comes to healthcare, it's kind of more of a black box that people don't really fully understand the inner workings of. So the idea of government controlling healthcare for some reason is palatable to people. I mean, you, I think you've quoted the numbers before as far as the percentage of people that support single payer. It's just it's astounding how how high the support is for that in America when people would never support government taking over food, yet they're OK supporting government taking over health care. Well, because it's it's kind of amorphous out there and um, it sounds it sounds it sounds good. I mean, you know, everyone's going to get the very best care and you won't have to go through the um, insurance, um, um, you know, the all of the issues that with the co right. is it going to be covered, whatever. I mean, if you look in Canada, the, the, um, the uh, alcohol is controlled by the provincial government. So if you live in, in British Columbia, the Liquor Control Board determines what liquors are going to be available, what wines are available. People, you know, they come to the U.S. and go, my gosh, look at all these different types of wines. You know, it's just in the same in food. You wouldn't have access to the great millions of options of food that you can get because it's not a right and it's not run by by the government. And so people, we want to push, we want to educate Americans on why we need more choice and putting consumers and doctors in charge and, and not the government. People, and even doctors, I mean, a large percentage of doctors now support 
Medicare for all. And I, they don't understand what it will mean for their pay, for how they practice medicine. But they think, well, we won't have to deal with the insurance company. And I think that's a lot of what it is. Yeah, well, and that's maybe the brilliance ultimately of Obamacare is to force everybody to deal with these insurance companies that we shouldn't have to deal with. But they mandated it so that ultimately people will throw up their, their arms and say, oh, government, take it over because this is such a mess. Well, the good news is the individual mandate came out in the jobs and tax bill of 2017. This is going before the Supreme Court right now. You know, is, is Obamacare going to, to stand or not? Probably it will, but I think they will get rid of the, the individual mandate will not will not stand as part of the Obamacare. Mm -hmm. But instead, what will stand is you have to cover pre-existing conditions, which right. is absurd. Right. Maybe we'll wrap on that, which which is this idea that I could have car, I could buy car insurance after the car accident. Right. Now, imagine exactly. if you could buy car insurance after the car accident, car insurance prices would would skyrocket because nobody would would buy it until you needed it. So right. isn't that where we're going to be left with Obamacare? If there's no individual mandate, why would I buy health insurance? I would uh, I would wait until I get cancer and then I would buy it. Well, I mean, oh, oh, under uh, under Obamacare, I mean, it was such a complicated issue and it's you know it didn't solve the problem of, of the uninsured and it didn't cut costs people need as i said people need options and the individual mandate you know was not successful i mean the 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 fine you know the um 2.5 percent of income which or or what was it 600 dollars whichever is greater i mean just did not did not work but people need people you know they buy house insurance they buy car insurance you want insurance for catastrophes not to cover as we talked about earlier your your blood test or your if you have a temperature well and frankly i i am curious your thoughts on this shouldn't insurance companies be able to take into consideration pre-existing conditions yes exactly but under 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 obamacare you know you can't charge differential rate i mean it's uh, the ratio i think is is three to one and it's not you know older people have more have more conditions and and it should the ratio should be five to one but of course it's um it's not under obamacare and and um it's as i say i mean it we we spent all that money to under obamacare to bring it in to cover eight million people in this country it would have been easier to give every one of those eight million people the very best private coverage it would have been cheaper and it would have been it, it would have been much more palatable yeah. All right, Sally, thank you so much for all of that. Um, I don't know if there's a easy solution, but I think we agree Get, getting government out is uh, the solution. But I, I don't know. It just seems like the ship has sailed. I, I mean, getting this thing turned around. Anytime the government gets involved in any type of, uh, you know, uh, benefit, taking away the benefit is impossible. Well, that's what Milton Friedman used to always say to me. He was my mentor and wrote the foreword to my very first book. And he said, how many government programs that are in have ever been, you know, eliminated? The mohair subsidy, I think, was one. Very few. It's very hard to take something away, even if it's not working for people. I think, oh my gosh, well, we, I can't, I can't do without that. So, if we get it, it'll be a catastrophe, and it'll be very hard to get rid of, as it is in Canada and in the UK. Thank you again to Sally Pipes. You can see a lot of her writings on healthcare at the Pacific Research Institute website. That's the Pacific Research Institute website. Thank you to our producer, Michael Parker. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back with another episode soon of The Hidden Truth Show. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week for another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow.